We're glad you could join us today for the Concepts of Faith broadcast. This program is dedicated to teach you how to put the Word of God to work so that it will make a positive difference in the everyday circumstances of your life. And now, here's Charles Capps. I want to welcome you to the Concepts of Faith broadcast where we are teaching again this week on the subject of scriptural balance to hard sayings. Now, we started this series last week. We're going to continue on it. We dealt last week with the fact that uh, Isaiah had prophesied, uh, seemingly saying that God would blind the Israel and so they couldn't see or hear uh, and be converted and be healed. We found the scriptural balance to that was that Jesus taught in Matthew 13 that their eyes they have closed. I mean, he straightened the whole deal out when you read it there. And then we found that the Apostle Paul was teaching the same thing in the 28th chapter of the book of Acts, almost verbatim, word for word, what Jesus taught. And, and the Apostle Paul had stated in Galatians that what he taught, he didn't learn it of man, but he got it by revelation of Jesus Christ. So we covered that. Today we want to start with uh, 2 Samuel, the 24th chapter in verse 1. And here we read where the Scripture says, And again the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he moved David against them to say, Go number Israel and Judah. Now, as you read in, in uh, the Scriptures, you will find that God did not want David to number Israel. Now, one of the reasons was that he said that they will be as number as the sand of the sea. So when David decided he was going to number them, God didn't want them numbered because they were not as the sand of the sea at that time. Now, what God was saying is that you won't be able to number Israel because they'll be in multitude so great as the sand of the sea. Have you ever tried to count the grains on the seashore, the grains of sand on the seashore? It's an impossible task. But now here David is. He is out counting the men of war, and so on. And uh, Joab, I believe it was, tried to talk him out of it, but, but he wanted to do it. And so it got him in a heap of trouble. Now, this verse indicates, now just reading this on the surface, I read it for years, and I thought, well, why did God do that? God didn't want him to number Israel. And then here it says that the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he moved David against them to say, go number Israel. Now, why would God move David to do something that he did not want him to do? God didn't do it. But you see, in the King James, it indicates that he did it. Now, if you have a reference Bible, and I have one here that has a little number one by the word he here, the personal pronoun. Now, down here in the center column reference, you look down here and you find where it says uh, number one, and it says that is Satan. In other words, Satan moved David to go number Israel. But you see, if you read that up here, the way it's written and translated from the Hebrew text into the English Bible, it indicates that God moved David to do that. And I've always looked at that and I thought, well, why in the world would God inspire David to do it? Then, uh, you know, he punished Israel because he did it. Well, it didn't make sense to me. I knew there's something wrong with it, but I didn't have a clue as to what it was. And some of you have been the same way. You look at that, and, and if you're not careful, the devil will take advantage of our ignorance. And, and I'll say it, our ignorance, you know, uh, like uh, Will Rogers said, everybody's ignorant just about different things. And there's some things we just don't know. But the Apostle Paul said, Study to show thyself approved, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So you get in here and dig these things out. And I had these questions, and I, I'd get these questions once in a while when I was teaching the seminar. Somebody would come, come and say, but Brother Caps, I don't understand why the Bible says this. Well, I didn't either, but I finally decided I'm going to get in there and, and dig it out and see what uh, it, it really means because I knew there's something wrong with the picture here. Uh, God's not going to move Israel, uh, David to number Israel when he didn't want them to number Israel. And, you know, I had a man tell me one time, he said, well, you see, God has a revealed will. He has two wills. 
<laughs> now, now, this man was a minister, called himself a minister of the gospel. He said that God has two wills. He has his revealed will, and he has his secret will. Now, the secret will, you see, is what he doesn't reveal to man. And, <laughs> and I thought, you know, I, I think this guy is really, you know, he'll qualify to park in the handicap zone. No, God has one will. His will is always the same. His word is his will, and that's what he wants, is what his word says. And we're to honor that word and to take it at face value. But you have to study to see if we miss something in the translations. Now, see, we talked about it last week, that Dr. Robert Young says that sometimes in the Old Testament, it will be when it's translated from the Hebrew into the English text, there's not a verb that can show the proper translation over, so it, it gets translated over and it shows it in a causative sense, indicating God caused it, when he had nothing to do with it, he just simply allowed it, or he permitted it because man permitted it to happen. You see, God will allow you to go rob a grocery store today if, you, if your head set on doing it. I mean, he's not going to stop you. Now, the policeman will, and uh, they got places for folks like that. But you see, God's not going to stop you from doing that. Uh, we know the script, it'd be against the Scripture, but you see, he would permit it in the fact that he wouldn't do anything to stop it. He, do, he has done all he's going to do about it when he said, The way of the transgressor is hard, and he said, Thou shalt not steal, or thou shalt not uh, kill, or thou shalt not commit adultery, and all of the, the, the Ten Commandments. Well, that's all God's going to do about it. He's going to tell you about it, and, and, and then you're going to suffer the consequences if you go ahead and do it. Now, you see here that David, uh, the indication is, that uh, it seems to say that God moved David to do this. But now uh, we have a, a reference, scriptural reference down here where the number one was in the scripture, and it says uh, Chron 1 Chronicles 21, 1. Now let's flip over there and look at uh, 1 Chronicles 21, verse 1. And Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel. Now, did that clarify it? See, that's why the Apostle Paul said to Timothy, study to show thyself approved, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Now, see, don't just take things on the surface and say, well, you know, the Bible said. Now, that gets you in trouble, and, and it gets a lot of people in trouble because they say, well, the Bible said. Well, not everything that is, is written in the Bible is what the Bible said. Now, listen to me very closely. Don't get offended at that statement. It'll turn out all right. Because, you see, the Bible gives you things that are written here that is really not what the Bible teaches because it will report things that God did not want to happen, and it reports things that people did that was not the will of God, so it's in the Bible, it's written in the Bible, but it is not what the Bible said to do, in other words. Uh, so we need to differentiate between the fact that God allowed it, and, and it's in the Bible, but it's not what the Bible said. You see, when we say the Bible said something, uh, the, the indication there is that this is what the Bible teaches. And I mentioned it before, Paris repeating, that Ananias and Sapphira told a lie. Well, it's in the Bible, it's found in the Bible, but that's not what the Bible teaches. It does not teach you to tell a lie. Now, here in verse, uh, chapter 21 of First Chronicles, in verse 1, And Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel. And uh, so Joab, he chose Joab to go do it. And Joab tried to talk him out of it, but he wouldn't have it any other way. He did, and it caused him a heap of trouble. And verse 7 says, And God was displeased with this thing, therefore he smote Israel. Now, you see, he, he has disobeyed God. Uh, Joab tried to talk him out of it. Uh, in other words, uh, God had told him. Now, remember, they're operating under an old covenant. God says, as long as you stay under this covenant and obey the Word of God, none of the curses will come upon you. You read Deuteronomy, the 28th chapter. And he said all these, it states the first 15, I think it's maybe the first 13 or 14 verses of Deuteronomy 28, he lists all the blessings of the law. 
there was blessings in the law. But then he, he says, if thou will not hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God, and you do all these things, then it starts giving you the curses of the law. And he said, in other words, you get out from all this covenant, the curse is going to hit you in the face. And, and here David has gone against the word of God, gone against the will of God, and he pro was provoked by Satan, not by God, to do this thing. Now, I've heard people say to me, you know, well, the Lord told me to do so and so. Well, knowing what they said the Lord said to do, I knew the Lord didn't tell them to do that because it violated the Word of God. But see, they was convinced it was God that told them that. Well, see, if they'd had knowledge of the Word of God and rightly divided the Word of truth, then they would have known that God wouldn't have said something like that in the first place. So here we have... Uh, a scripture that gives you scriptural balance to this hard saying that seems to say that God provoked David to stand up and number Israel. Well, it wasn't God at all. It was Satan, and this verse right here plainly states that it was Satan that provoked him to number Israel. Now, uh, let's go over to Exodus, the fourth chapter, and let's deal with another scripture that I know some of you have looked at it and you've thought, well, now I don't know about this and uh, trying to figure out what it means. Exodus chapter 4 and verse uh, 20. And Moses uh, took his wife and his sons and set them upon the donkey, and they returned to the land of Egypt. And Moses took a rod of God in his hand. And the Lord said to Moses, When thou goest to... to Return into Egypt, see that thou do all these wonders before Pharaoh, which I have put in thy hand, and I will harden his heart, that he will not let the people go. Now, now let me ask you something. If God is the one that's hardening Pharaoh's heart, we got a problem here. Because if he, if he goes there and through Moses says, let my people go, now, does he want to let them go, or does he want them to stay there? I mean, God's not schizophrenic. There's got to be a scriptural balance to this. <laughs> well, there is, and I have good news for you. Now, see, we're talking about scriptural balance to hard sayings. So, here we have uh, a scripture that seemly, seemingly says that God will harden the heart of Pharaoh. Now, I'm going to read that verse again. It's Exodus 4, verse 20. Moses took his wife and his sons and upon the donkey, and they returned to the land of Egypt. And Moses took the rod of God in his hand. And the Lord said to Moses, When thou goest to, uh, into Egypt, see that thou do all these wonders before Pharaoh, which I have put in thy hand. But I will harden his heart, and he shall not let the people go. Now, we, we have something here that, that most people just say, well, you know, God can just do what he wants to. He can harden your heart or he can, you know, do what he wants to about it. Well, let's back up. Let's go over to the 8th chapter. Let's follow this to the 8th chapter of Exodus. And let's look at verse 15. See, follow these things out. And verse 15, it states, but when, uh, well, let's back up and read a, a verse or two before this. Uh, verse 12, And Moses and Aaron went out from Pharaoh. And we're going to have to back up further. Here, this is when they got the frogs. <laughs> now, let me put it, put it this way. <laughs> uh, back at verse 10. And he said, Tomorrow, he said, Be it, uh, We've got to back up further. I tell you, I read the Bible backwards sometimes. Verse 8, Then Pharaoh called Moses and Aaron and said, Entreat the Lord that he may take away the frogs from me. Now, the, the frogs covered the land. They were in the house there everywhere. And he said, From my people, and I will let thy people go, that they may do sacrifices unto the Lord. And so then he comes down here and he asked him, he said, When do you want these frogs to go? He said, Tomorrow. In other words, give me one more night with them frogs. Now, I don't know why he wanted another night with the frogs. And he said, And the frogs shall depart from thee and from thy houses. Now, when we come down to, to uh, verse 13, And the Lord did according to the word of Moses, and the frogs died all uh, out of the houses of all the villages and out of the fields, and they gathered them together upon a heap, and the land stank. 
But when Pharaoh saw that there was respite, he hardened his heart and hearkened not unto them. Now, who did it say hardened Pharaoh's heart? Here. It says Pharaoh hardened his heart. Well, now, did God harden it or did the Pharaoh harden it? Well, here it says Pharaoh hardened his heart. Well, now, over there we read a scripture that said God said he will harden his heart. So we have a, a, a contrast here, and we have a, seemingly a paradox that, that uh, leaves some valid questions of uh, which, which way is it. Uh, so what we need to do is just to search it out a little. Now let's go to chapter 9, and let's read, uh, I believe we'll read verse 12 here. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, and he hearkened not unto them, and the Lord, as the Lord had spoken unto Moses. Well, now, here again, it says the Lord hardened his heart. Now, let me reiterate it again. Some of you probably didn't see the broadcast last week when we talked about it. Dr. Robert Young, who's one of the foremost authorities on the Greek and Hebrew language, said in the Old Testament, sometimes in the Old Testament, in the Hebrew, because there's no verb that can be translated in the exactness into the English. I mean, the, the, the English has no verb that will translate the Hebrew in the exactness of what the Hebrew said into the English language, that it appears in the English text as a, in a causative sense, indicating that God caused it or God did it when God didn't in fact do it or didn't in fact cause it. So uh, this is what we see here. One place it'll say Pharaoh hardened his heart, then it'll say that the Lord hardened his heart. Now let's check just a little further into it. And let's go to verse uh, 34 in this same chapter. And when Pharaoh saw that the rain and the hail and the thunder were ceased, he sinned yet more and hardened his heart. <laughs> now, now we're, we're about to come to the, to the bottom of this thing. He sinned yet more and hardened his heart. Well, now, which way is it? Did God harden it? And the heart of Pharaoh was hardened. Neither would he let the children of Israel go, as the Lord had spoken by Moses. Now, you see, God knew that he's going to harden his heart. And because it's, it's said that God knew that he would harden his heart, it is translated here that God hardened his heart. Now, remember the Hebrew mentality was, if God permitted it, and if God knew about it, it must have been the will of God, so why don't we just say that God did it? And then, of course, when you translate it into the English, it, you can see how it's translated both ways right here. It's, it's a little confusing. So there, there are valid questions about that, and I know that some of you have had, had these valid questions. Now, uh, Dakes, Finus Dakes, who, who uh, is the author of the annotated uh, Dakes Bible, uh, has a wealth of information concerning uh, this. And, and one of the things that he says about it, and I think it was in one of his other books that it said, uh, God's plan for man, he makes this statement, and, and I think it clarifies it so much, and I've used it many times. He said, uh, if you take a uh, lump of clay, you know, and, and work it up, you've got a lump of clay that's moist. You set it out in the sunshine. And then you take a, uh, uh, a ball of wax. You know, years ago when they uh, were to can vegetables, they sealed it with wax on the top, and it would uh, it harden, and, and it would keep the air out. It would be airtight, you know. And uh, so you take the a ball of wax, and you put it out in the sunlight. You put the clay out in the sunlight. Now, they're both exposed to the same thing, the sunlight. Now, what does the sun do to the clay that it does not do to the wax? Not one single thing. It heats both of them. It shines on both of them just the same. So then can we say that, that the sun hardened the clay, but it melted the wax? It made the wax pliable where you could just mold it into anything you wanted. But it did the same thing to both of them. Was it the sun that did it? No, it was the condition of the substance that was affected by the sun. Now, here's, here's the crooks of the whole matter. Pharaoh 
his heart was not right with God. And when God sent miracles and signs and wonders to make him pliable where he would let God's people go, that was God's will, that he let his people go. However, God knew that he would not let them go through foreknowledge. Now, he was not predestining him to harden his heart. He just told Moses beforehand, he won't let the people go that easy. You, you're not just going to go up there and he's just going to open the gate and say, everybody go home. No. But see, God had that through foreknowledge. But he did not predestine him. It was the condition of Pharaoh's heart that caused the miracles, the signs, and the wonders to just harden his heart. Now, I ask you, did the sun do anything to the clay that it did not do to the, to the wax? No, it did the same thing to both. The clay reacted because of the condition of the substance, and the wax reacted by becoming very pliable where it could be formed in any manner. Now, this, this is what we need to understand about this, this matter right here, is that God is trying to reveal to us that there is a way that you can become pliable if you will take heed to the Word of God, allow the Word of God, to make your heart pliable to where you can change and do what God wants you to do. Now, see, when you get into the, uh, uh, I think it's Romans, where he talks about, uh, uh, well, maybe it's, we, we'll find it on one of the other broadcasts and talk about it, where he says you can, you can make a vessel of honor or you can make a vessel of dishonor. Now, what, what's the difference between a vessel of honor and a vessel of dishonor? Well, a vessel of dishonor is like Pharaoh who would not be pliable in the hands of God. Through the miracles, the signs, and the wonders, God is trying to convince Pharaoh to be pliable to his will, let the people go, but because of the miracles, signs, and wonders that was wrought through Moses, it says God hardened his heart. But now, who was it? It was Moses that did the miracles, or work for God, you see, and it was the, his resistance to the miracles that hardened his heart. It was the condition of his heart that caused it to become hardened. It was God's intention that he let the people go. Now, would God have said, let my people go, if he didn't want him to let the people go? Well, I know that there's some people that, that get in there and dig around and think that it well, it, well, it's God's will, and he just hardened his heart. Well, then if he did, he may harden your heart, see? And that's where the problem comes in. This is not the kind of God that the Bible teaches because the, the sunlight does nothing more to the clay than it did to the wax. It was the reaction to the heat that was put on it, and God put some heat on Pharaoh and be, now, you've heard this. You've heard people say, well, they're just an old uh, gospel-hardened sinner. No, no. The gospel never hardens anyone. The gospel is preached so that you will become pliable to the will of God. But when you resist that and become obstinate against what God said, you harden your own heart. There is no such thing as a gospel-hardened sinner. There is such thing as a sinner that hardened his heart against the gospel, but there's no such thing as a gospel-hardened sinner. And can you see that this gives scriptural balance to what seems to be or is a hard saying in the Bible? One place it'll say Pharaoh hardened his heart. Next place it'll say God hardened his heart. The reason it says that is because God brought another miracle and he, Pharaoh, <laughs> Pharaoh reacted to that miracle by hardening his heart. So God brought the miracle and Pharaoh hardened his heart, so in places it says God hardened his heart. How did he do it? With miracles. But you see, miracles don't harden everybody's heart. Sometimes it makes people pliable in the hands of God. Can you see that? I don't know whether it helped you, but I talked myself happy. Hallelujah. It is such a blessing to hear the Word of God taught with such clarity. What you have heard today is a result of intensive study of the Bible and inspiration of the Holy Spirit. I remember hearing some of these things that Dad talked about today in the church where I grew up. You know, a lot of Christians believe that God is against them, making them sick, hardening their heart, and otherwise terrorizing them 
to teach them something. It makes God sound like a split personality, half good and half evil. Jesus said, the thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. But I have come that they might have life and had it more abundantly. If you ever have a question about the character of God, just look at Jesus. He spent his ministry destroying the works of the devil. So many people need to hear this message. Our offer during this series is offer number 2249, Scriptural Balance to Hard Sayings, for $12 plus shipping and handling. Some of you have heard only parts of this broadcast. Now this offer will give you the complete message taught in a live seminar. It's called Scripture Balance to Hard Sayings, and it is offer number 2249. You can order it online at charlescaps.com or call toll-free 1-877-396-9400. Don't let religion twist the scriptures and bring you into bondage because of lack of understanding. For years, some of these scriptures have been taught in such a way to make people fearful of a loving God, and it has crippled their relationship with God the Father. Hearing the Bible taught in this way caused me to have distorted ideas about God when I was growing up. It took years of study of the Word and listening to teaching like you heard today to set me free from false ideas. Now, Jesus said in Matthew 13 that when someone hears the Word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the wicked one comes and catches away what was sown in his heart. I have often heard of people who are turned off to the Bible because parts of it just didn't make sense to them. This in-depth teaching could turn them around. You can order this message on two compact discs today by calling 1-877-396-9400. If you want to order a copy of today's broadcast, you can order it on DVD by asking for a copy of TV program number 68. And we also have the teaching in MP3 format. You can download it from our website at charlescaps.com. Just look for the tab that says TV Offers. Now you can use your credit card or pay by check by phone and we will get your order out to you right away. At the website you will find all of our products and have them shipped directly to your door. That's 1-877-396-9400. Now I want you to remember what my dad always says, that the devil is defeated, God is exalted, and Jesus Christ is Lord. We are glad you could join us today for the Concepts of Faith broadcast. This program is dedicated to teach you how to put the Word of God to work so that it will make a positive difference in the everyday circumstances of your life. To order the product offered on today's program, send your check or money order to Charles Capps Ministries, or to place your order on Visa or MasterCard, call 1-877-396-9400. For more information about Charles Capps Ministries or for a schedule of meetings, write to Charles Capps Ministries, P.O. Box 69, England, Arkansas, 72046. This broadcast has been sponsored by Charles Capps Ministries and our partners in this area.